Welcome to Let's Talk About It. Broadcasting live from North Nashville, Tennessee. North Nashville spans from Metro Center down to the border of Bicentennial Mall, including the neighborhoods of Bordeaux, Buena Vista, Parkwood Estates, Germantown, Haynes Manor, Jefferson Street, Fisk Park, Cumberland Gardens, Oak Valley, Enchanted Hill, and many others. It's perhaps best known for the three universities housed here, including Tennessee State University, Fisk University, and Meharry Medical College. North Nashville is home to Pearl High School. In 1966 the first year that the TSSAA was fully desegregated, Pearl's boys basketball team won the state championship. Considered one of the leading black academic high schools in America. On June 2, 1898, Pearl's graduated its first high school class. Now live from North Nashville, Dr. William Head. Let's talk about it. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Let's Talk About It. I'm your host, William Head, coming to you from beautiful North Nashville, Tennessee. Not to be uh, confused with uh, North Little Rock, Arkansas, or West Memphis, uh, Arkansas, but uh, the two of which are... Uh, independent cities. Uh, North Nashville is a thriving metropolis within the uh, uh, confines of Metro Davidson County. Uh, as usual, I've got some foolishness to talk about. Uh, first of all, the most serious thing is the crisis in the Sudan where the Sudanese are having to sell their female children into marriages to raise enough money to buy food. With all the food that black folks in this country waste and the money we waste on food, seems like we could uh, find a religious organization that we can trust uh, to send a plane or 10 planes to the Sudan to feed these people. They shouldn't be in that shape with as many African Americans as they are. I've got the first hundred on it. Somebody tell me how we can get that done. Let's move that. Uh, the rising tide of the females in this country, the women, some women don't like to be called females, the women, not ladies, Ladies, you've got to go to work. Women, you've got to go to work. If you think the last election was important, watch this midterm election. If you don't get these uh, extremists out of Congress and don't allow them to tip the scale in uh, their favor in the Senate, uh, you're going to be in trouble. We're going to be in trouble. Now, the thing that, that, that is so unique about this situation is that all the issues this time around are universal issues for everybody in this country. Gun control, abortion, voting rights, all are very important issues in the, in, in the coming years. And given the direction that the Supreme Court of course, uh, with three newly appointed re uh, Republican justices and the direction they're taking the country, uh, you know you've got to have a Congress that is going to support your, uh, your needs, not a bunch of old men making decisions about an 18 to 20 year old young lady who's about to have a child. I'm 74 years old. I don't need to be in the decision-making process of a young lady who is uh, 18 to 25 or any young lady who wants to uh, decide how to utilize a situation to her best advantage. Her Make sure that her health is good. Make sure that the child she's bringing into this world is going to be healthy and functional. I don't need to be in that. They need to make that decision on their own. 
And the only way that's going to happen is that abortion becomes a law in this country. Ladies, you have the ability to make that happen. You are 55% of the voting population. Listen to what might happen uh, as, as we talk about this uh, killing of Roe v. Wade. Uh, they might start arresting women who self-abort or have a miscarriage and uh, prefer criminal charges against us. They may create laws that criminalize women by charging them with harm to a fetus, uh, concealment of a birth, abuse of a corpse, practicing medicine without a license. States may pass laws which make seeking an abortion a crime. Any pregnancy loss will be perceived as criminal and uh, the courts will prefer those women to be examined thoroughly after a traumatic event in their lives, the loss of a child. These laws were passed by anti-abortionists as uh, protection for women and turned out to be leverage for keeping them from being able to have an abortion if they so choose to. This information I got from a, an article in the Atlantic from uh, written by Miss Jelson, uh, Melissa Jelson. 314 mass shootings in this country this year. 314. The Fat Sam Award this week goes to Darren Bailey, a Senate candidate in the state of Ohio, I'm sorry, a gubernatorial candidate in the state of Ohio who suggested that the people uh, in uh, Illinois uh, pray and move on to celebrating the independence of this country. These people just lost friends, relatives, children, people that they cared about, and this idiot is talking about move on to celebrate. Think about this. Beautiful, safe, happy, loving, peaceful community of Highland Park people with their children in hand, with chairs and flags and pinwheels, going to a parade. 35 minutes from violent, corrupt, black Chicago, where all bad things happen. We're so very happy that we live 35 minutes from all of that, we're, we're safe and happy. We have churches that are full to brimming on Sunday. We're having a wonderful time. Our children are happy and everything is going well. And then boom, 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 boom. And people start scattering and running People are afraid, deathly afraid. People are lying on the ground dead. People are lying on the ground having suffered awful injuries from a young man on top of a building who is shooting with a, a military style rifle. Boom, boom, boom. Is this Highland Park? I thought this only happened in Chicago and places like that. All you suburban housewives who Trump so elegantly portrays as his minion 
his uh, friends and, and neighbors, now you know it can happen anywhere. Doesn't just happen in places that are criminalizing people. Doesn't happen in the ghetto. You have you haven't heard of any mass shootings in Chicago's bad neighborhoods. If you did, it was a drive by. It wasn't just somebody who was just shooting just for the heck of it. They're trying to make a living on the street, which does not at all say it's okay. It is just as bad as anywhere else. You have a young man who walks into a grocery store in New York State and kills 19 people. You have a, 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 a youngster who has been bullied and, 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 and teased who seeks his revenge on second graders. You have this man who has been living in this pastoral area where it's nice and clean. The streets are clean. The, they roll up the sidewalks at five o'clock and nobody ever raises a voice. And then boom, boom, boom. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? I have been warning parents since before school was out. Have a place when your child is away from you that they know they can go to and you know where they are and you have the ability to get to them and bring them out of danger. I've said that several times. I did my lost in space, warning, warning, warning. It ain't funny no more. It ain't funny no more. And this is not just talking to any black parent, I'm talking to everybody. Every time you allow your child to go to an event, go to the movies, and school in another month will be resuming, a little more than a month, school activities will start, football games, soccer games, volleyball games will start again. Do you know where your children are? Are they safe? Do you know where you can go and pick them up? Have you prearranged it so that they know where to go? The little boy that lost both, both of his parents the other day, who became an orphan in a split second. He became an orphan. He had two parents living breathing and caring and he became an orphan in a split second do you know where your children are are they safe let me get off my soapbox before it turns over and today ladies and gentlemen as I climb down from my soapbox we have with us representative Vincent Dixie, one of the up and coming uh, legislators in the state of Tennessee. Uh, Vincent, how are you this afternoon? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Mr. Ed. Uh, with all the space that uh, this latest uh, mass shooting is taking in the newspaper or on the internet uh, uh, what is the position of the state of Tennessee in its current 
uh, law that allows anybody, I think, over 18 to legally carry. Uh, is there any any uh, movement toward uh, corralling that at all? Uh, no, I just want to make one quick correction. You still It's still the law. You have to be 21 years okay. of age to carry a gun. But they do have to open carry. So you don't have to carry a uh, concealed carry like um, gun license anymore. You can anybody can carry a gun. They can walk down the street with a handgun in their hand, in their pocket, in their belt, and the police have no authority to stop them because now we're an open carry state. Um, so I do not see, I do not foresee that being repealed anytime soon. But I think that we can take action and put some pressure on the governor and uh, his Republican administration in order to to do something about this because if we if now is not the time when well the 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 Supreme Court last week or week before struck down a law in New York that required people to have a uh, a license to carry a concealed weapon and uh, left New York with everybody that was uh, of age with the ability to carry a firearm for, for personal protection. Um, that sounds like anarchy to me. Well, at the end of the day, you know, the Republicans have done a masterful job of convincing people that Democrats want to take their guns. We don't want to take their guns. We just are for sensible gun ownership and people who have a gun should be trained on it and know how to use it and understand the, the severity of a gun and what it can do and how it operates and what it can do to a human body. So what we're doing is we're asking an average person to have the same ability that a trained police officer has to take a life at a split second decision. A split second, we're asking them to do that. Now police have struggled with that. Now you're asking someone who doesn't train on it on a regular basis, you're giving them that same power to do so. Um, it's a it's a it's a recipe for disaster. And when this bill went to effect, I warned the my colleagues that our violence rate and, and our gun violence rate is going to go up tremendously over the next two years and it has it has gone up tremendously every day you turn on the tv you see it used to be that they were 18 19 20 now they're 13 14 15 year olds 16 year olds out here killing each other and it's because of the ease and the access of guns and people don't know how to store them and keep them properly um away from being stolen out of cars even their homes but you know we have to push for gun safes and just just gun safety laws that are just sensible common sense laws well it it, it strikes me as being almost uh, criminal that you would leave a pistol in a car that was not locked or leave a pistol mm -hmm. in a car, period. Because mm -hmm. uh, if someone wants to get in a car, knocking out a window is no problem whatsoever. So mm -hmm. uh, these, uh, is, is and, and this is really probably going to add, add some question, but if a person's pistol that is registered to him or her is stolen and a crime is committed is there a level of culpability on their part uh, evident there do you think it is you know that, that's a that's a loaded question and i'll tell you why because sometimes people forget that they may have their gun in their car or like there's been plenty of times that maybe you run into the store real quick and you left your wallet in the car and what if in that split second someone broke in your car stole your wallet should they be held to the same level of responsibility as somebody who just always leaves their car unlocked or leaves their gun 
without a case or just unlocked. Um, now, I'll tell, I, you know, to be transparent, I am a gun owner and I have a uh, concealed carry list. I have, I have a lifetime one, so I got it before all this happened. But I train on my guns. I go, I go regularly to the the, the gun range, and I. But I never leave my guns in the car by themselves. If I carry it with me, I always have it on my person or with me, or I leave it at home where it's locked and stored. Um, so I think that there's an opportunity for us to at least have the conversation and start the legislation about what happens when someone leaves their gun in the car overnight and they do it on a regular basis and it's stolen. Um, I don't know what the answer is to that, but we, we have to figure out that. But that is one of the reasons why um, there could be a little muddy water at that point. Yeah, well, the, as as quick as people are to file a lawsuit against you, you certainly don't want uh, something that you own to be part of the loss of a life. Uh, Correct. And and or in, or in a crime or any crime for that matter. That's true, but but these uh, these youngsters with guns that they steal out of of cars, there there are no injuries, they're deaths, uh, and and uh, they their kids, they're 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. We say they should know better, uh, but. Uh, they couldn't do that if they could not access a firearm. So uh, the liability to a person whose firearm is misplaced or stolen and the, and the theft was from the glove compartment of their car, I think they, uh, they have uh, a greater liability liability than a person whose uh, firearm is stolen from their house. Uh, I really I agree. go ahead. No, I said I agree. Uh, I I really when we first set up this interview, I was uh, more interested in some information we had at the Black Caucus meeting. Uh, what almost a month ago now, isn't it? On uh, yeah, Jefferson Street. It was June eighth, I believe. So almost right, right in a month. Right. Uh, but I'll ask you some of the questions that, that came to my mind, uh, as especially when you were talking about school funding. Uh, the school funding formula for the state is very convoluted, and uh, and and and. I won't say that it is uh, it is discriminatory because I find that outlying counties, uh, small counties in the state, suffer a great deal from lack of funding. Uh, not just not just the uh, the inner city schools, but the small town schools where the uh, the faculty is uh, folks who have exceptions because they could not hire uh, a person with the re the credentials to teach the class, so they end up hiring somebody who might be able to. Talk about that funding formula a little bit, if you will. And as soon as you get through, we'll uh, we'll break for a commercial. Uh, but but give me. Uh, uh, the cook's tour of the of the funding formula for the state of Tennessee. Well, let's start with the actual amount of funding. I mean, you know, the governor always says that you know we're adding a billion dollars into the educational funding program. That that's not true. Um, basically, we still have the same amount of money that we had already in in uh, in the education, and they're just redistributing it. That's all that they're doing. The billion dollars basically is split up into two pots, 750 and 250. And some of that money, it basically all of it goes to infrastructure. Um, so it doesn't go to into programming, into into salaries. It doesn't go into um, funding nurses, counselors, things of that nature. So that's why it's it's a little funny to me. You know, if it walks like a duck and it cranks like a duck, it must be a duck. 
is that how are we going to fund those particular positions with the same amount of money when we know number one that it's not enough money to begin with and you know they the one thing that i do like it has some good points and it has some bad points it can be worked out but it's not easier than what we are already doing you can't just look at a form and say all right a b and c is what you get and then this is what you get per student it's the same type of convoluted mess that we have now and to go back and start over and like 30 years ago is the reason why we ended up with the BET formula and it was uh, born of a lawsuit and this BET formula was meant to satisfy that lawsuit for the short term no one ever meant for it to be in place for 30 years but it was so but it took them almost two to three years in order to come up with that BEP formula for something that worked this governor and his administration basically pushed it through in five months there's no way it's been properly vetted figure out what a pit holes are and let us talk about it figure out what's going on bring in some administrators bring in the actual boots on the ground to who this particular formula is going to impact and get some of their thoughts and concerns about this that when we had this particular debate on the floor our debate was cut off we were not able to ask any questions about this uh, and they have this weighted system it's the five weights and the ones that concern me the most is the economic distress and um uh, economically poor uh, disadvantage and the one that is um uh, oh, I forgot the other just escapes me right now. Uh, but there were two that I understand where the weights come from, but I think it's still going to hurt us because when I say us, I mean the people in the black communities that are underserved. Because uh, one of it is based on if you qualify for free and reduced lunch. Well, some of our families, they won't fill out those forms or they don't fill out those forms. So you're going to have an undercount, uh, underrepresentation of people who actually should be counted uh, for in a free and reduced lunch. But if you were to use the insurance option that they have for kids, every parent signs their child up for insurance. That would be a better way to make sure you capture every child or every student that is eligible for this those are just some of the things that i do and then i'm not really sure you hint on it earlier about how uh rural areas get another bite at the half apple um because they fit into another way i do not agree with that because we still have the same problems in urban areas and in the inner city so why do they not get an additional weight as well so i feel like that is discriminatory but there are issues that are different in urban areas that are different in rural areas but this formula does not compensate for that and uh that's kind of a quick and dirty of like why i like it you know it's not good it's not great but it's not all bad it has it can get to where it needs to be but um, under the current administration and the super majority, I don't think it'll get there. I think we're going to see a lot of pitfalls and we're going to see the way that they set up this formula. And I know I'm going into a different question uh, but or a different area. Just keep but going. I've been ringing, but I've been ringing an alarm on this governor and his administration when it comes to these um, ESAs, his educational savings account. Now, everything he's been doing in his administration is to get us to that point. You know, he started out, you know, with Nashville and Memphis, setting up them as, as you know, for, uh, programs for ESAs. Then he set a charter school commission that is appointed by him, the people who think like this, so now they can bypass the LEAs, the local educational agencies, and go straight to this statewide charter school commission and get approved. Now you have this funding formula that's by the student student formula based now they can put a dollar amount for each student so now they know what they can take to the charter schools when they introduce this hilldale hillsdale college that wants to open up 50 to 100 which the governor just we saw on the news he said he would rather them open up 100. so if you see it's the loan game that happens and you take one down individually it may seem an innocuous that it's not a big deal. But when you look at the entire picture, you see a plan that was put in motion. And the Democrats here have been trying to sound the alarm on this for years. 
since he's been in, in in his administration, since Lee's been in his administration. But now the the rubbers are meeting the road right here. We are here. What are we going to do? He's already basically disrespected our teachers. And what, what are we going to do? Are we going to lay down and take it? Or are we going to show him that there's more power with the people? The, the, the strange thing is he has no respect for the public school system at all. And, and I know nothing of his educational background, but I would say that he probably finished maybe the eighth grade. He might have finished high school. Uh, uh, what is it that makes him a... Uh, such a proponent of breaking down the public school system. Uh, he, he, he absolutely has no expertise. He says that just anybody can be a teacher. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't understand that. I think he made some formidable uh, uh, enemies uh, last week or this week. Uh, not uh, defending the public school system of the teachers in the state and there are a lot of teachers who are underpaid that he still doesn't want to pay well one of the things is he wants to monetize our public education system and he wants to make it a Christian education system well you have to realize everybody in Tennessee aren't Christians you can't basically he's weaponized the Bible and he wants to legislate through religion you can't do that in tennessee everybody that's the whole point of being in a free society you choose what you want to roster so they uh when when i say they i mean the, the republican administration uh, they uh, look through the educational system as a blonde hair blue-eyed person that lives in a two-parent household in the suburbs and that are middle class people they don't consider anything else about that. And, and it's upsetting that we have a governor that only governs for a segment of Tennessee rather than all Tennesseans. And, you know, we have to do something about this. People cannot just sit here and take this and say, well, I, I kind of like this, but I don't like that, but, I, but I've always voted as a Republican, so I'm going to always vote. You know, I'm going to vote for whoever's running for a Republican. No, you have to vote for whoever's the best person for that, that, for that seat and can do the job that align with your values. Um, so we've seen here, it's the long game that they play, and we have to get smarter and try to educate people that you cannot sit this one out. We don't have the, op we don't have the option to sit this election cycle out. People have to get to the polls and do what they're supposed to do and go vote. That is the that is the answer to all the questions that we present, which is that the people have bec have to become more uh, intellectual. Uh, I don't want to say intellectual, informed of how things are being taken away from them, while they're being presented as something that is going to enhance uh, their their existence. When you look at the people in East Tennessee and Appalachia. And you're talking about a charter school, you know, that gum charter school. We need to pay the teachers we got to teach what we need taught. Uh, and uh, your observation about uh, uh, trying to uh, inject uh, Christianity in, well, religion into all parts of the governmental uh, effort. Uh, goes directly against the separation of church and state. Uh, and I want to just correct you on one thing. It's not religion. You had it right the first time. Christianity. Okay. If religion implies that they're okay with the Muslim or Islamic uh, faith. Uh, they're they're okay with Buddhism, which they're not. It's only Christian faith based initiatives. So I just wanted to make sure I back you up a little bit on that one to know that it's Thank not. You. Just this religion on that. But I also want to just bring this home is that Tennessee in the last election cycle, we were 46th in voter turnout, 46 out of 50 states. So imagine if people came out to vote and did what they did. If we could move the needle to 42, 
I mean, that's hundreds of thousands of votes. Tennessee doesn't have to be red. The only reason it's red is because Democrats or people who align with Democratic values do not come out and vote for some reason. And we know that they do a lot of voter suppression and they make laws to try to keep it hard for us to vote. But we have to overcome that and get out there and vote. Yeah, and the, I apologize for interrupting. You. Not a problem. That I'm I'm here for you to be talking, not me. Uh, <laughs> in the in the last presidential election, it became apparent that if we get out and vote, we can get it done. Uh, and this time around, uh, there is, as I said earlier in my monologue, a lot of the issues are not about black or white or racial issues at all. They are universal issues that are pertinent to everybody in the state, everybody in the country. We've got to quit having people shooting up uh, 15, 20 people uh, just because they're angry about something. We've got to do something that keeps people's uh, uh, rights in place. We've got to do something about uh, 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 youngsters being educated in a positive environment. Uh, you were saying that the state's new, not new billion dollars is more or less dedicated to the superficial, uh, the buildings, the, the, the facilities, and does nothing for the instructional portion of what goes on in the school. Uh, I think that the, in my last uh, inspection of it or uh, look at it, Missouri is the lowest uh, rated, uh, well, lowest funded state for public education in the country. And we are tied with Mississippi, Louisiana, and, and, and uh, Georgia, I believe, in our funding. We would need another two billion dollars just to catch up with Kentucky, <laughs> an additional two million dollars just to catch up with Kentucky. So I mean, it, it, the numbers don't lie. It is what it is, and I think that we, as a people, we have to demand more from our elected officials. I think that you know, it, I would say going back to two thousand eight, that's where we saw a shift in politics, where it became more racially segregated or more racially motivated the way that people voted and they ran to a democrat or a republican instead of thinking about who's the best person for the job then after that that in, in after 2016 that's when we really saw a radical shift in the politics in in, in in this country people now feel comfortable going back to the days in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s of actually voicing their opinion on how on race and where they think that we should be as black people and we should be put in our place and where now, women should the, be as uh, uh, in their they need to be back in their place right so i'm the chairman i'm the chairman of the house democratic caucus and to put this in perspective i'm the first black person to ever hold that position in the state of tennessee and I got that position in 2020. 2020. So in 2020, you elected the first black. I think that's ridiculous that we're saying that in any category. But that also shows where we're heading as a, as a state that they're open to leadership from all. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, red, or any other color. And to go back to our educational um, uh uh, conversation. I think that, you know, the one thing that we we should be focusing on is how do we solve certain issues like poverty, right? If we solve the poverty issue and as a Democratic caucus chair, there's only like four things that I'm, I'm really working on. And that's how do I make sure people have money to pay their bills, uh, shelter over their head, food on their table, and if they get sick, they can go to a doctor. That's what I'm focusing on. Because if people have good jobs and they can support their families, they're not out robbing, stealing, killing, or chilling because they got to get up and go to work tomorrow because they are they're they feel important and, and, and have some meaningful and gainful employment. And this governor said that he's all about 
criminal justice reform. He hasn't done anything but make it harder on people getting out of jail and keeping them in there longer, especially with the truth and sentencing bill that they just passed this year. They're going to keep people in jail for a long time. And most of that are people of, that look like me and you. And when someone goes to prison, their entire their family does that time with them. They have to put money on their books and they have to do that. So you putting that extra burden on the, some of the most vulnerable population that we have in this state. How are you helping them? You're not. So I'm sorry to kind of hijack the conversation, but no, uh, keep hijacking. These are just things that are on my. <laughs> these are just things that are on my mind. I want people to understand that it doesn't have to be this way. I hope it's not lost. I promise. I'm hopeful. The reason why I wanted to become the Democratic Caucus Chair was because I felt like I had a vision for this state of Tennessee and how they get us back to a position in Tennessee of where we can actually govern. A supermajority is not good for anybody, but we need to be in a position where we at least can talk about some issues and one side has to talk to the other side in order to get a real solution to the problems that Tennesseans face on an everyday basis. So. Well, with that, we will go to a commercial. This is Let's Talk About It. I am your host, William Head. Ed's Fish and Pizza House 1801 Drive DB Todd Jr. Boulevard is a soul food restaurant for as long as there have been soul food restaurants. We have been serving the North Nashville area since 1972. At Ed's Fish we have a very specific way of serving it, the hot fish sandwich. A couple of crip fried fillets often totaling a pound. Spritz with hot sauce are arranged between two to four slices of white bread with raw onions, pickle chips, and mustard. Various accompaniments are available including coleslaw and fried potatoes, but the classic companion is a serving of sweet sauce spaghetti noodles. Ed's Fish serving the North Nashville area. Give us a call 615-255-4362 or drop by today. Welcome to the North Nashville Business Directory. North Nashville is an up-and-coming area known for the Buchanan Arts District, with artisan studios and independent shops displaying handcrafted wares and hip fashions. Dining options tend to be casual, with pizza, craft beer and southern fare on the menu. Nearby, Fisk University's striking 1876 Gothic Revival Jubilee Hall was the South's first permanent structure dedicated to African American education. North Nashville is also the home of Tennessee State University of Public Historically Black Land Grant University in Nashville, Tennessee. Founded in 1912, it is the only state-funded historically black university in Tennessee. North Nashville is also home to Meharry Medical College. It is a historically black medical school affiliated with the United Methodist Church and located in North Nashville, Tennessee. Founded in 1876 as the Medical Department of Central Tennessee College, it was the first medical school for African Americans in the South. Another historic site in North Nashville is Hadley Park, which opened in 1912, is on 28th Avenue in North Nashville, between Fisk and Tennessee State University's two historically black colleges. More than a century ago, it was hailed as historic, being the first park purchased by the city and set aside for the exclusive use of colored people. Hadley Park was formerly a slave plantation owned by a white slave owner named John L. Hadley and his family which had lived on the site. Once the plantation was made into a park after centuries of slavery, the city named it after Hadley to honor him. Today's show is sponsored by Ed's Fish and Pizza House. Located at 1801 DB Todd Jr. Boulevard. Live from North Nashville, it is now time for Let's Talk About It. With your host, Dr. William Head. Hi, my name is Bobby Legs. I have a shop at 2525 White Street Pike called Auto Repair Shop. We do all types of automobile repair, brakes, air conditioner, all types of vehicles. If you have a car out there that needs repairs, come see us. We'll work it in. If we can't fix it, we'll get it fixed. Just come see us. Our hours of operation, we normally hear from 9 to 5, sometimes later, Monday through Friday.
Welcome back to Let's Talk About It with my guest, Representative Vincent Dixie. Uh, we've talked about quite a few things in the first segment of the program. Uh, this segment will be somewhat abbreviated uh, because of previous commitments. Uh, Representative Dixie, the 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 I guess the disdain that our current governor has for public education. Uh, do, 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 do you have any idea what the source of that must be? You know, it's interesting that you ask that because, you know, his wife is a former teacher. And I wonder what she thinks of the comments and his behavior and some of the policies that he's putting in place. Um, I think that he's showing you who he is, right? The, the president of the Hillsdale College has, has shown for years who he is. Our governor is aligning himself with him. We do, there is something we can do in this state. People have the power, we just have to use it and exercise it. He's shown, as you said, he wants to monetize our public education system to fatten the pockets of his friends. He wants to basically dismantle the public school system here in Tennessee. And I want you to think about that. Let's say, like, I think you used the example of Johnson City or in Appalachia. They're, they're struggling to keep one school open in the community as far as a, 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 an elementary school. They may have one elementary school that's open. Now, you bring a charter school in there, where are the kids and the money going to come from? Something's got to give. Something's got to give. And more, more than likely, the way that this administration, they're going to pump more money towards the charter school because they're giving them money for buildings. They have a, a, a set-aside pot of money for charter schools to use. And I'm not, a, and I, don't get me wrong, I'm not against charter schools I, am. I think charter school i think some charter schools are needed to fill in a gap but it's not the untrained right charter schools are more like a side it fills in gaps that are needed but it is not the main ingredient in this recipe of public education i think that there's an opportunity for us to I, let me back up as we as we went through COVID, we saw that kids learn in a myriad of different ways some in the traditional school setting, some do virtual, and some charter schools can specialize in helping those kids learn in those different ways. But the way that the governor is going about it, trying to replace public schools with charter schools, I think that's a boring. And we have to pay attention to what he's doing. Uh, because I'm a product of a public school, and I think I did okay. And I think what we need to do is put more resources into the public school system. And when I say resources, it's not always about money, but it's about the position to give the teachers and the administration the support that they need in order for them to do their job. And we stop putting so much regulations on how to do what they need to do in the schools to make it successful. There are some school systems here in Tennessee that are very, very good. We have some school systems that are top notch, but instead of modeling after them and giving them what they need to do that, we take away. We continue to take away. And you have legislators up there that the only educational experience that they have is that they went to school, right? <laughs> and then sometimes that's sometimes that's questionable, right? <laughs> but I agree. But but we sit there and we make laws that impact teachers and their administrators on a daily basis and we don't consult them at all and that's the part that's a problem you know if you don't consult the stakeholders how can you really know what you're doing is impactful well the the republican way is to make laws and then watch them blow up uh and right. and and, and, come, and come back and make more laws yeah so they can come back and make more laws uh, I, I had a young man to tell me about his having lost money out of his eye, uh, what, 501, not 501c3, but in the, one his retirement, yeah, 401k, having lost money out of his 401k, uh, 
and the the, the Democrats this and them. I say you 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 must back up. Do you not remember the tax uh, the tax laws that were changed during the the administration of forty five that told you we can let you have more money to take home uh, every week. But then you found out on the other end, your usual windfall in, in April and May and June completely failed. Didn't have any wind in it at all, and you all mad. That's where the blame lies. I think a lot of times there's not enough education of people so that they understand how things, like you said a few minutes ago, how things evolve uh, that eat them alive as as the the uh, as time elapses. Um, I think this this particular midterm election is either the 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 recapturing of the of the uh, country or a capitulation to uh, these folks who are bound and determined to make this country a uh, a religious uh, state a, a, a quote unquote Christian the thing now is how do you de define Christian it, it certainly is not what I see uh, and what I've been taught all my life that I see going on uh, the, uh, the 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 things that 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 bothers me most uh, we have discussed the control of guns the 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 education system how it's been dismantled the worst thing about charter schools is like you just mentioned a moment ago where does the money come from I do not want my taxes that I pay to go to open a, opening a charter school period sir I just was happening to get to get a, a news thing to come across my phone is while we were sitting here and there's a thing called skill learn elementary it's a charter school in Hamilton County apparently they had an agreement with the Hillsdale College to uh, to purchase this curriculum and run it that way but apparently after the video that they saw on the news of the president of the Hillsdale College making those insulting com comments about teachers they they've retracted that and rescinded that that deal they backed out of it so there are things that we can do here there are things that we can do now this is a charter school that technically can operate autonomously right in our school system and they did the right thing so this shows me and in Chatt in hamilton county is, is a red county this shows me that they don't want this people don't want this and but we have a tone deaf governor who's going to push his agenda no matter what because you have a governor that wants to be the governor again but he also wants to be something else right on the federal level whether it's the vice president president or, in, or holding some type of a uh, uh, head head of an agency and that's a problem and my thing is and, and we've talked about this before if you just do your job things will happen for you but i don't like i don't have any aspirations to do anything else i just want to do my job for a short period of time hopefully groom somebody else to come on and do it better than i did and move on and whatever happens whatever the good lord has for me then that's what happens well this governor seems to be of the opinion that he is the king of Ten king of tennessee and his kingdom is bound by the uh cumberland river on the on the east and the Tennessee River on the west. Uh, all you folks in, in Appalachia and, and in the mountains and hills of Tennessee, some of the most beautiful country in, in the world, all you people in West Tennessee and all the farming communities, are you going to pay for some Yankee values to come to your community? Uh, we'll go back to the Civil War. They're now sending the Union troops to teach your children how to live. Are you ready for that? Vincent, thank you so very much uh, for being with us. You, you've enlightened us. You've, uh, you've given us some things to think about. Uh, 
I'll close the show as I always. Go ahead. I said, I'll give you one parting, one parting thought. And I, I said, make one parting statement. The mob don't have anything. Let me let me use my correct broken English. The mob ain't got nothing on Bill Lee in the GOP administration here in Genesis. I believe these are some these are some straight up gangsters. I I don't doubt that in the least. That they will steal your children and bury <laughs> bury you if you're not worth not uh, watching. Thank you again, Vincent, and. Uh, I'll close as I usually do with a quotation from the Reverend Dr. the late Reverend Dr. Dale P. Andrews, former uh, chair of the uh, Department of Homiletics at Vanderbilt University Divinity School. I have more questions than answers, more problems than solutions. From these gifts, I freely share. God bless and keep. Know where your children are. Know where you can go and find them when things bad go down. This has been Let's Talk About It. I am your host, William Head.